Hello, everyone from Florida Memorial University here in Miami, Florida. My name is Dr. Mark Williams. I'm the Global Scholar Practitioner here at our Florida Memorial University, and welcome to the Florida Citrus Sports Esports Symposium. And today we're going to talk about something very important. We're going to be talking about how esports has evolved in the education space. As of to date, to date, 81 universities have an esports course curriculum or, 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 or some kind of level of esports in terms of academics or certificate program. Today we have two an amazing guests. Uh, one of the gentlemen that I know, I've got a chance to meet him uh, almost a year ago. We met each other uh, down in Miami at the Ultimate Gamer and uh, we got a chance to talk and collaborate, uh, talk about collaborating. His name is uh, brother uh, Marcus Howard. He is the CEO of Met Arena. Uh, he's in Tampa, Florida. And another brother he introduced me to recently. Uh, again, you, when you are on LinkedIn, let me tell you my friends, LinkedIn is the most powerful engine on social media in my opinion, okay? If you really wanna get connected to people in your social space, or you wanna know someone in whatever space they're in, LinkedIn is the key. And this brother here, Derek Watford, he's the uh, CEO of High Point Gamer. I'm like, I, I, first of all, Derek, you and I didn't talk before about this, but thank you first and foremost for serving our country. Okay, this is brother's a veteran. This brother is on point. He is very, both Derek and Marcus are brilliant men, period. Oh, and they just happen to be black men too. Yes, there's <laughs> black men too that do some things in esports arena, not just playing the games, but they are the brains behind a lot of these things that we don't talk about. So I'm gonna let them loose and kind of tell you a little bit about themselves, starting with Marcus, and then Derek talk about their brand what they're doing in the city of Tampa and what they're doing with education. So welcome Marcus and Derek. Thank you. Welcome to this, this amazing uh, symposium here by Florida Central Sports. So Marcus, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction, uh, Dr. Williams. And, and thank you um, Florida Central Sports for making this all happen. My name is Marcus Howard. I'm CEO of Metarine. I'm also the president of a nonprofit called the Tampa Association of Gaming. Uh, I got Super Mario Brothers for three for Christmas when I was six. Been playing video games ever since. And that actually inspired me to learn coding. In the ninth grade, I started building my first, coding my first app on the TI-83 Plus graphing calculator. Fast forward 20 years, IT degree, working in the industry, work with Tencent Games and, and DreamHack. Um, and last year, really kind of expanded into esports fully. Uh, I produced an esports event at DreamHack in 2017, co-produced iHeartMedia's first esports event in 2018. Um, and I saw this larger opportunity to connect brands of all sizes, including schools, with esports to make it more accessible to people from all walks of life. So that's what my platform does. We combine esports with education to make esports accessible. I love that. What, now, what made you decide that you wanted to get in this space, even though you've been connected to the space since you were a kid, a young person, uh, what made you decide esports is the way to go? Well, in 2017, we just we really just kind of got pulled into the esports space. We were already producing live events because we wanted parents to understand there was more to video games than Halo, right? More to video games than, than Mortal Kombat. So we started doing these free in-person activations so that there were different games and that parents could see there were different games. So we could start to have that conversation around, you should appreciate and value video games more for what it can bring to your, your students' lives and their professional careers. And it just, you know, it took off and now we're in this space. Love it, love it, love it. Derek, now, again, we talked about you being a veteran. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how your, your background being a veteran, uh, being in the service, brought you to the space we're at now. Well, so we started out High Point Gamers. We were producing tournaments first in the community, Madden and 2K tournaments, trying to give teenagers something to do that was productive outside of uh, getting in trouble. Uh, when we did those tournaments, we quickly realized it was a thing, and that thing was called esports. Um, when people are coming from out of state to compete in your tournaments, and going through that process, we were able to work with in the NBA's 2K League and kind of see the behind the scene working of how does an inaugural esports uh, activation spin up, especially from someone like the NBA. Recognize the troubles that they were having, the challenges they were overcoming, as well as the brands that they were bringing on, the challenges that they were trying to overcome, as well as the challenges that the uh, gamers were experiencing, because this was a new thing. There wasn't a pipeline that prepared them for the professional circuit. Uh, so we recognized those gaps and said, hey, how can we make this industry be sustainable? How can we make it be successful so that other people can continue to have the opportunities, which is an economic opportunity, to participate in this industry based on their passion for gaming or if they have passions outside of gaming that lends itself to supporting the gaming industry. Uh, and that's when we got into the consulting side. Um, we recognize that there's 
We like we're firm believers that esports promotes economic empowerment, social inclusion, diversity, and tech and STEAM interests. Um, and we all need that right now, especially the way the landscape is going towards tech. That's where the jobs are at. AI is taking over. Uh, we see the changes in COVID-19 and we said, how can we use esports and gaming to help bridge um, that interest into something that could pre better prepare them not only to take care of themselves, but also take care of their families as well as benefit the community. Now, the, the, what, real quick, what, what branch of um, the service were you in? Are, are, I was are, in the Army. Army, okay. Yes. Have you, do you notice that uh, is there, are there a lot of leagues out there uh, where military are participating in these sports too? I know there's a few, uh, but are, are, you, are you heavily active in that space as well? So there's a there are large community, especially on the veteran side, that use gaming uh, from a mental health standpoint and from a connection social standpoint. Uh, we're actually working with the U.S. Air Force Special Warfare. Uh, they recently uh, started to use esports as their recruiting efforts uh, since the pandemic uh, started. So we, yeah, we definitely see the connection from a veteran and military standpoint because uh, when you think about uh, military community. Uh, you're taken and moved every two to three years. And when you move every two to three years, those relationships that you've built um, either stay at that duty station or they go on with you, hopefully, to the next duty station. And thus gaming, being able to play multiplayer and connect with old friends and old buddies allows you to maintain those relationships, which is an important part of being in the military, especially for veterans. Once they transition out of the military, they recognize that the civilian world is a little different when it comes to camaraderie and, and brotherhood, et cetera. So uh, they rely on gaming to keep those connections going. So, Marcus, you, you mentioned something interesting. I'm going to pose a question for both of you. Um, Marcus, first, you know, what are some of the challenges that you face um, as, as a, a person that occupies a space that when you're trying to educate parents about the opportunities, the career paths for, 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 for their children, what are some of the challenges that both of you face in terms of articulating this, or, the, or, or are they challenges at all once, once, you, once you get in front of the parents? Great question. And I always see challenges as kind of a hidden opportunity, right? But the challenge I see in the space is just kind of uh, ignorance, right? And, and not intentional ignorance, but just not understanding the space. I mean, even most people who work in the gaming industry and, and on the esports side, like people in gaming don't understand the opportunities in esports. And people in esports don't understand the opportunities in gaming. So when I go to parents and I go to teachers and I go to gamers, I have to just educate them help them understand that, you know, there are potentially hundreds of people who put hundreds of thousands of hours into this disc that they have, they now hold and they're playing for, for leisure. And because of that, there's everything from accounting to legal, to software development, marketing, um, you name it, right? Basically everything that, that happens in the traditional workforce environment, especially things in the traditional sports infrastructure are, are being migrated over into, either already were or are now being migrated over into gaming and esports. And one of the challenges that I've had with the community when it comes to education is because of the digital divide, many people only know the script of gaming is a waste of time, game is sedentary. Um, but then when you dig deeper and ask them, why don't you like gaming or why wouldn't you want your child interested in gaming? Um, most of them really can't give you inf any reason outside of, well, I don't want them sitting around playing video games all day. And so then the education of what the opportunity and how that bridges them into other opportunities, like I said, the light bulb comes on and, and parents realize that, okay, with some structure and some focus, um, I can use this gaming industry to my child's benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that I find interesting as well, I, I'm, I'm the Global Scholar Practitioner at Florida Memorial University. What that means is I'm starting a uh, STEM related program here at the university. A lot of people that are thinking about the video game industry, I think about Robert Morris, the first school that started in 2015. And I think of Becker College, you know, with Alan Ritaco down there, the amazing dean down there. I think of um, Joey, uh, uh, let's see, down in Shenandoah, Dr. Joey, uh, you know, he's <laughs> doing amazing things there. I think about, uh, let's see, who else is there? We got um, uh, Doc Haskell at Boise State, was coach of the year. But again, a lot of people are not focusing on STEM. They're focusing on just a comp comprehensive program. I focused on STEM because one of the things that I think that we're lost in, and you touched on this, Derek, about looking at the technology where the game, where the, where the jobs are gonna be at. Um, people think STEM, science, engineering, math, but they forget about this thing called technology, okay? <laughs> they forget about this. And when we start educating, especially people of color, that, that technology is part of the STEM component, 
and that we all are part of that, we now get a chance to do that reverse Jedi master trick on them and get our young kids and our families and people of color to believe that they're STEM too. And I didn't think that I have a doctorate in education and I have an MBA and I worked in the sports and entertainment industry. It, it took the, the, um, the, uh, the provost at Florida Memorial, Dr. Cooper, when they asked me to come to the school, Mark, make, make, it, make it STEM focused. And I, I, didn't, I, had, I knew what they were talking about, but I, even me, as, as, as accomplished by society standards as I am, I was kind of like STEM. I don't know. I, is that me? Am I STEM? And I, and I had to start thinking about it. I'm like, wait a minute. I am STEM. We all are STEM. And so I want to give a shout out to Dr. Cooper for believing in me and also President Hardrick at Florida Memorial University for wanting me to come to an HBCU, but be able to uh, communicate uh, the, the STEM approach to, um, to, the, to the masses and people that are want to come to the schools. And Marcus and, and Derek, in your, in, your, um, in your experiences, when you're, when you're advising universities or even high schools about the, the esports arena, when it comes to the academics, um, do you talk about STEM and how important is STEM? I'm asking this question on purpose. I know what Marcus' head is around, around this issue. That's why I'm saying it this way. How important is STEM in terms of how we educate people about esports when it comes to academics and also career paths? How important is that to, to communicate that message to the families, Marcus? I think it's vital. Uh, you know, just like with traditional sports, only you know 0.01% or some top tier percentage, limited number of people get to be professional in the space, and then everyone else, you know, has to go find something else to do. And so the same thing is reflected here in the esports space. And it's just not that realistic that every individual is going to become, you know, part of Team Liquid or the next Ninja. But what you can do is take those skills you've built while you were building your, your interest, your passion in gaming and esports and translate them to other things, again, like software development and sales and marketing. And I use my own story. Again, if, if it wasn't for video games, I never would have, I could have never imagined any other way that I would have learned to start coding it at the ninth grade. Because my parents tried to get me to learn to code in ninth grade to build websites. And I had zero interest in it. Like I had an HTML book, I threw it in the corner. I had nothing to do with that. But as soon as I figured out this was made with code, right, then I was all in. So I think it's important to help everyone understand that. And, and as Derek can attest, two years ago, we partnered with Junior Achievement, which is a nonprofit around education and, and financial opportunity, particularly for underserved communities. Uh, we helped them integrate video games into their Steam camp where we taught the kids how to build games, which was teaching them how to code and how to run their own businesses. So wow. I, I think it's, it can't be more important. Right, right. That's interesting, that's interesting. What, what, what about your, I know you, Derek, you and uh, Mark's on the same, you founded the same organization, but what is, what is, how important is it for you to articulate that? Um, and then how hard, actually not how hard is it, um, what, how, how do families feel when you tell them about, hey, this is a STEM focus and your kid can do it too? So, so from based on my background, um, I have a photography and video uh, music studio as well. So I deal with a lot of young artists or people that are aspiring to be artists that come through. And in doing that, I recognize that here is a pool of young individuals that have dreams and aspirations to be great, be recognized and be respected. But they don't have a way to channel that with some type of support without technology. Um, as a music artist, you know you're not going anywhere. You're not going to be able to be successful uh, because technology is reliant on that, on your success. And so, therefore, I know that STEAM, I consider it STEAM, is a very important part of, of, of just you, what we're trying to do You're adding the music to it. You're saying STEAM, right? Like yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Because cause when you hear STEM and, and STEAM, you like to think that minorities aren't participating and we're like, we're not present somewhere. But then once you include the arts, you realize that, hey, we're really dominating that and we are part of STEAM uh, heavily. Absolutely, and, and, and I think about, as I think, as I think about some of these organizations, uh, we just partnered with a Crockett Foundation down in Fort Lauderdale uh, by Henry and Zach Crockett. They both were NFL players coming from that, that community and they created uh, an organization for young people to learn about coding and esports and gaming and AR, VR, and these kids are middle school kids. And we partner with them, we work with them every every month. We bring them two different speakers from the space to talk to them about what they're doing and what their interests are. And the fact that they got them this young is amazing. And so it's, it's really cool to see uh, young people uh, as early as middle school, maybe even younger, that are participating in this space. When I think about you know, education, I think about UCI, right? UCI, they have this amazing 
program. They have summer programs for kids. And I'm thinking, you know, Marcus and, and Derek, where do you see the future or have you seen that already at universities where that are in our communities, like whether it's in Tampa area, if it's in Miami, if it's in Atlanta, have you seen where um, elementary schools or middle schools or high schools are really catering to people of color and in terms of learning about the ecosystem and the gaming industry outside of the outside of the games itself, but the academic side. Have you guys seen that or do you see that as a future or are you guys already doing it or can you just give a shout out or, or give us some information about people that you know that are doing it effectively? I know JCSU um, and, and they partnered with us along with Oakwood University to help with the event we had two weeks ago. You know, they're, they're trying to push that as well. And you are as well at Florida Memorial uh, University. And what my company is doing is actually developing a virtual gaming and esports course that we can use to complement what FMU is doing or JCSU is doing so that you can make education more accessible, right? Everyone doesn't have four to six years to dedicate to a degree or the 20 to $40,000 it takes to fund a degree. But if you can create kind of a micro credential, it both helps people kind of onboard themselves more quickly into a professional career and may even kind of create a pipeline into these, you know, four and six year, you know, university programs. Mm -hmm. And then real quick before Derek, um, when he's talking about Johnson C. Smith, that's historically black college. Um, we talked about Oakwood. You're talking about Dr. Bernadette Lawson, John Cash, doing amazing things down there as well. Um, and so you want to talk about, and so, so I want to make sure we, we're giving everybody their props when we mention people, right? Always got to give people their props. Um, and then Derek, you, you, you were about to say something. I'm sorry. I was going to say, um, Marcus has been doing a tremendous job of trying to uh, create a facility that supports uh, esports, tech, and uh, cryptocurrency uh, in the minority community in St. Petersburg. Um, we're currently mm -hmm. trying to find funding for that to finish that off and, and fully execute that. Um, when it comes to other organizations that are doing well, I think Junior Achievement is doing a good job. I also think Middleton High School, they have one of the top um, uh, STEAM or uh, magnet schools here in the area. That's a underrepresented community. They're doing very well. I think for the most part, organizations are struggling uh, because they think that the only problem is exposure and education when it comes to STEAM interests. And so they think, okay, if I spin up a program and say I'm teaching coding or I'm teaching gaming or whatever, that's all that's needed to get the uh, Black community interested into that. And it's not. There's another part to that um, that needs to uh, support that. And that is the visibility of the success that can come from these type of interests. Uh, we're competing with entertainment industry. Uh, we're, we're competing with professional athletes mm -hmm. from a, a superstar status, celebrity status, et cetera. And a lot of kids, that's what they want to be. And that's what they want to do because of that status. And so in order to get them over into STEAM interests, you're going to have that group that's like, yeah, I love technology. This is great. I want to get into it. But you're going to need that other group that's like, what am I going to look like? What am I going to dress like? Who's going to like me? Who's going to respect me if I come over here and get interested in drones, artificial intelligence, et cetera? And that's part of the story that we have to do a better job at uh, telling. Right. And that's one thing that Major League Baseball struggles with all the time. They, they're competing with, oh, they see LeBron and they see, you know, uh, you know, God bless his soul, Kobe when he played, or Steph Curry, and that's what they're competing against. They're competing against that. They see this every day. They see it marketed that way, so the kids are going to want to be like them. Uh, I remember an interview you did, Derek. You were talking about, you know, Ninja. You know, are, are, are little kids really, try, little black kids from urban communities, are they really trying to be like Ninja no, or, or no. Sonic Fox? Probably not, because not that something wrong with Sonic Fox, but, 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 but we haven't seen someone yet that has quote unquote, that flavor of the month where people are like, yo, I want to be like that cat right there. The way they wear their pants, the way they walk, the way they, the way they carry the controller. I don't know, but, but we haven't, we haven't gotten there yet, but we're, I think we're getting closer. And you also mentioned something really interesting. I'm going to go back to Derek and then back to you, Marcus. Uh, you talked in your interview too uh, about PC versus the console, right? That's the other piece of it that's missing is that right. a lot of people will say, well, why aren't the people of color? Why aren't they playing the, the, the PCs? Well, because they, they may not have accessibility to it, right? Uh, right? Also, you might be living in a rural area. You may not have it. It's not like water, where it's regularly you can get it anywhere, right? So it should be like water. It but should it's be not. like water. Everybody doesn't have broadband, sorry, all right? right. And, and also in our, our African brothers and sisters, I, I've, I've talked to Africa, uh, I've talked to so many different uh, countries in Africa over the past year, and they they don't have broadband. So they, they're focused on, on what? They're on this. This is what they focus on. 
they don't they don't have PC, they don't have a console, okay? So 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 one of the things that that I think is a challenge, and I think Derek, you touched on this really well. I want you to kind of expand on this. Um, how do we get people to really understand PC versus console, you know, PlayStation, Xbox versus having everyone having a PC? Because everyone can't afford a PC. How do we get to the place where we where we um, educate the public about it, but also get some of these big brands that maybe invest so that everybody, there's, there's power, equal parity. So the benefit between console and PC for one is the economic empowerment that comes between the divide. Like you can get into gaming, entertainment, connection, the social aspects on the console side, as well as on the PC side. The benefit in the PC side is the PC opens you up to do additional things uh, that gen generate additional revenue, meaning that I can sit on my PlayStation and be real good at 2K with the content that I'm streaming from that or being able to stream from that to generate additional content is probably going to be small compared to the person that has the PC where they can chop up footage, post it up, live stream with it, and then have that revenue come back from uh, Twitch or YouTube into the household. And that's really the big divide that I see between console and PC so that the brands that have the power to make that change, to close that digital divide, could close that digital divide and open up economic opportunities. Okay, Marcus. Yeah, I think there's an infrastructure issue there. Um, and I know there's some up and coming companies that are trying to address it. Like there's a up and coming, and I'm, I'm escaping the name right now for the league, but there's a league specifically for consoles, right? So if we need the kind of infrastructure to support from the publishers, the publicity, Back to Derek's point about kind of the fame and the prestige, we need that around console gaming and mobile gaming the same way we see it around PC gaming. Because 21% mm -hmm. of esports super fans self identify as black, and 83% of uh, African American teams play video games, which I believe is like 15% higher than every other demographic for that age group. So it's not like we're not playing, it's just not, we're not given the, the opportunity to be compete at that level. And so when we have more infrastructure, you'll start to see more success stories, which goes back to Derek's point. We need to see people being successful in esports to inspire other people to want to be successful in esports. Right, and one of the things that I find fascinating, um, especially this past year, we saw because of the pandemic, um, we saw this, this conclave of so many different black universities, HBCUs, um, that are now saying, hey, we're here. Uh, you mentioned you know, Florida Memorial, Johnson C. Smith, Howard University, Hampton was the first one to really come out with a major grant. Um, and then the pandemic happened. <laughs> and it's like, okay, where, where are they at now? What's going on here? Um, and Tennessee State, there's a number of schools that are really doing some great things. I'm excited about Morehouse University, Morehouse College. Um, I also love what HBCU Heroes is doing, Tracy Pennywell and George Lynch. George Lynch and Tracy Pennywell both attended University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. They have no affiliation to HBCUs, but they're working hard as a nonprofit, giving computers and giving uh, providing scholarships for students of color that go to HBCU, that attend HBCUs. You have the HBCU Esports Alliance that I co-founded with Rod Chappelle. Uh, he's doing an amazing job there, creating infrastructure, creating opportunities for students to get scholarships. We got community with Ryan Johnson and uh, and and, uh, and and John and John uh, Cash, mm -hmm. and yeah, doing doing amazing things there with community. You have BCGA with Keisha Walker. She's also I'm on her board, and we're creating pathways for students to get scholarships to go to schools. Um, and then there's um, a, a, a plethora of other people out there, but not there's not a lot, right? There's only a handful of us. And it's very important for us to all stick together and work hard and, collect <laughs> and collectively coming together. And we don't. And I'm not, it's not even just the black community, no, it's, it's all communities. It's because community. if we all come together, if all communities come together, the one thing I love about the video game industry is that it seems like it's um it's open to people that are serious about it. But if you come, you know, you come, you come and you're not gonna, you're not gonna give the right attention to it, right? And be like a culture vulture. You're going to be found out quickly and people are not going to want to work with you. Um, one of the things I want to talk, I'm going to pivot really quick, uh, talk about some of the big brands that are doing a good job of really trying to bridge the, the global divide between, uh, let's say, the, the people of color, uh, uh, let's say the HBCUs, and then women getting, creating pathways. Uh, what companies have you seen uh, that are doing a good job at really trying to bridge that digital divide and really helping to educate people in terms of the higher education wise, getting people opportunities that you've seen, or have you seen that at all? Uh, Marcus and Derek? So, uh, Go ahead, Derek. 
Derek, okay. Um, one person I group I want to shout out is DTLR. They've been doing a great job at recognizing the value in the space, uh, okay. but not just from a how can they benefit from a brand standpoint by infiltrating the space, but how can they actually add value to the space to create, like you said, additional opportunities? And that's the route that they've taken in the esports space because um, mm -hmm. DTLR is a fashion brand. They know about the cool. Uh, so for them to jump into the space and try to bridge that and help bring exposure to me has been um, a thumbs up for sure. So people don't know DTLR's downtown locker room. Okay, <laughs> so people know we feel like what is this? What are these uh, acronyms? <laughs> so, so yeah, if you're cool, you can see DTLR. Say you know uh, Florida's FCS, right? But sometimes you know the old cats got to give you give you pay the whole name, right? Right. But but, but yes, yes, that's downtown locker room as a sports retailer. Yes, and Marcus. Yeah, I, I haven't seen a lot personally uh, on the higher ed space, but again, every challenge is an opportunity. I will give a shout out to uh, Fem Gaming. That's a, a new group that was launched up in Canada. There's also Girl, Girl Gamers, which is up in Canada. And I think we just had a, a new group spawn up here in the U.S. It's, it's Queens Gaming Collective or Queens Collective. And, and it's about, again, kind of helping educate and, and create solidarity for women gamers. They're, you know, 51% of gamers in the U.S. are women. So it's, it's appalling, really, to see the lack of, of, of opportunity and parity, given what the number of people who are playing versus the people who get the spotlight for playing. Right. And I want, so what I want to say is that what I've seen from not just working with, um, you know, the HBC Esports Alliance, um, I got a chance to see what companies and brands are really giving back and wanting to see how do they become more immersed um, with HBCU. Gillette's one of them. Gillette was our title sponsor, is our title sponsor for our league. We have over 30 HBCUs that are a part of the league. Um, Zaxby's another one. They were a presenting sponsor. Uh, another group that I'm that's doing amazing work is PlayStation. PlayStation has a division now called Black at PlayStation. So all the black executives of PlayStation, they're working collectively oh, wow. to see how they can work collectively with um, HBCUs and how do we get uh, more people of color connected to that space. So shout out to Davina Mackey for, for, for doing amazing work there. Google is doing some amazing work as well. Riot with Angela Roseborough, she's doing amazing work with, I think, Johnson C. Smith and some other HBCUs that they're working with. I think it's um, Arkansas Pine Bluff is the other school that they're working with as well. Um, and then also you've got people out there and we can all shout these people out because it's very important to talk about those individual people outside of the, the, their uh, corporate executives titles, people like Wim Stocks. Okay, who, who's, who clearly is someone who believes in uh, equ equity and DNI. Uh, you have people like uh, Tommy Knapp. Okay, who's down in Fort Lauderdale, right where I'm at. Uh, you have Stephen Henry down where I'm at as well. You got Hip Hop Gamer. Uh, you've got Keisha Howard. Uh, you know, you've got uh, Belong Gaming, who are one stocks as part of that. Neil Duffy. Uh, there's so many different people that don't look like us that want to give back to us and once once and want to create the um, the connection, that connectivity. That's what I love with uh, Florida City Sports has done here by creating that 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 awareness. Uh, what people don't know is that they may or may not know Florida City Sports for this, but they have one of the biggest classic games in the, in, the, in the history of college sports, the Florida Classic with Florida for Florida A and M and Bethune Cookman, and they 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 that's they occupy that space. So Florida City Sports, shout out to Steve Hogan again, CEO Steve Hogan again for for wanting to have that connection with those communities. Just because you're not a part of those communities does not mean that you can give your support. And, and when you have a daughter or you have friends that are of color and you see that they don't have those opportunities, you're, you may want to, you may start taking it more personally. Like, how do we, how do we fix this? Right. And if it's not you doing it, maybe, you know, someone else that can help bridge that gap. So, so as we continue to move forward on this topic, uh, Marcus and Derek, uh, what do you think are the, what, what do you think the future is and the, 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 the most immediate future and then the more, the, the far foreseeable future five years from now, what do you think it's going to take? What are the, some of the things that we need to do more of to make sure that the HBCUs and that women and people of color are getting the opportunities to, to, um, to create pathways for them to be uh, in these career paths? I think events like this help. So again, thank you to FCS for making this happen and, and Dr. Mark for making time for this. And, and I, I'm remiss now for having not mentioned this earlier, but a shout out to Trinidad over at Niantic. Niantic is the developer for Pokemon Go. And they just announced this new program that was providing that is providing funding for prototype development of augmented reality games, um, mm -hmm. you know, for underrepresented communities. So if, if you're watching this, definitely go check that out. 
and it, and you know it's funding for you to a learn about the technology and then b get it to a place where it either can be deployed through Niantic or or you have it part of your own portfolio so you're creating your own professional career. Uh, but you know that's that's what I'd like to see more of in the immediate future is more actual support from gaming companies and non-gaming companies, endemic and non-endemic sponsors. Last year we saw a lot of uh, I like to call it diversity theater, right? A lot of people putting up black squares and, and you know, post and solidarity. Uh, and, and I don't mean to be cynical about that, but, you know, actions speak louder than words and, you know, put your money where your mouth is. Yes, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I wanna, definitely want to see more. Derek go on that one. Go ahead, <laughs> I think we need to see more resources being dedicated to that inclusion. Um, me and Marcus alone have taken thousands of meetings where we meet about the opportunity. And yes, people want to work together, but then when it comes time to actually struck a check or to provide resources to execute those activations and programs, that's where you get the stutter step. And, mm -hmm. and having that stutter step in the process of saying you want diversity and inclusion and you care about it uh, doesn't pan out well because it, it takes resources. It takes resources to build up programs, staff programs, execute programs, et cetera. So I wanna see more of the money being passed around to be included in the actual economic pipeline. Like if we say it's a, a multi, $100 billion industry, ask yourself, how much do you think black people should get out of that? Do you think out of every billion, a black person or a collective should have a million or 200 million? Like, what is your number? Not just, oh, everyone should be included. Like, what? tell me your number and what you think that should be based on a billion. And that lets me know how you really care about inclusion and, and diversity in this space. Oh, look, look, we we keeping it real here, okay? We're not, we're not sugarcoating this. We're just being direct and, and straight with you. So let me let me break it down for you a little bit more. Okay, Derek knows this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. $200 billion industry, okay? With a B, all right? $200 billion industry, all right? And esports represents what? Maybe a barely two, a barely two billion of it. So if this was baseball, this is any number one, okay? So, so we haven't really begun to, to show what's, what's possible here. And, and, to, and to Marcus's point, I, I'm not cynical about it, but I'm real about it. There are a lot of people that saw the, G, the George Floyd murder. Yeah, murder. Yes, you saw it. You watched it live on TV because of the pandemic. If we didn't have a pandemic, not too many people with eyes would have been on it. You saw Breonna Taylor, Breonna Taylor murder, right? And now more companies, more than ever, hey, how do we do this? How do we become more inclusionary? And I love that. It's great. But as Derek said, action speaks louder than words, right? And I may, I'm going to take a more softer approach to it to where I, I don't want to put a number on what we should get. My thing is if you're willing to take the if you're willing to take the meeting and you're willing to say that you're supportive of it and you're willing to say, hey, I'd love to learn more about it. Like you talked about downtown locker room doing being about it. Then if you're going to do that, it's not even about the money anymore. It's about the resources. It's about and it is about the money, too. Right. But we we are we're asking those companies, those brands that are out there saying that they want, they believe in DNI. You believe in it so much, then you got you got to be about it. You can't be talking about it. And for me, everyone wanted to know why did I go to a HBCU when I had nine different offers from nine different his predominantly white schools, including LSU. I was at LSU before I came here. Okay, passed up on Clemson, passed up on Dartmouth, passed up on a uh, Harvard, UMass, all these schools. And even St. Thomas University, which is next door. I came to an HBCU for a couple of reasons. One, because all my family went to HBCUs. I attended HBCU and I believe in HBCUs. My, my president, my fraternity brother, Dr. Hardrick, called me and said that we need you because we need to see pe young people need to see people like you that's done it so that they can see it for themselves, right? And then the third thing was we they they had a grant, a grant. They were they were about it because I said in the middle of the in the pandemic. In June, I'm gonna come down to an HBC or any school and you don't have any money for me? <laughs> oh, that's not happening. I'm not doing anything for free. Not happening, okay? And none of these brothers here, Derek, Marcus, uh, Community, uh, uh, BCGA, uh, HBCU Esports Alliance, HBCU Heroes, these organizations need, they had to keep the lights on. They need your help, okay? And you can't, it can't be lip service. We all have talent. So I came because they had this grant. And how do you obtain grants like that? Well. The uh, White House Initiative or HBCU, they have money. See, no one tells us this stuff, okay? I'm telling you right now, that's one organization. I work with Betsy DeVos, uh, former Secretary Betsy DeVos and former President Donald Trump and uh, John Jonathan Hollyfield at the, at the HBCU White House Initiative, and they have money. The Department of Education has money 
to talk about how do we find, find ways to improve, to, to fund uh, 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 nonprofits and uh, educational institutions to help people learn about uh, esports. But no one knows this. I just discovered this three years ago, okay? So if there was no grant and any money, there's nowhere in the world I would have came, no matter what school it's at. So no, no matter if it's a university, no matter if it's a, a corporation, you have got to give back. If you really want to see this grow and you really want parity here, you're going to have to give to black organizations, the women's organizations, uh, underrepresented organizations that are out here, because we're never going to have any parity and we're never going to have any equality. And you're going to have brothers like Marcus Howard, Derek, and many others out here spinning their wheels over and over again. And we need it needs a change. But I'm looking at companies like PlayStation, Google, Riot, uh, Belong Gaming, and many, and many others that are out there. Elijah Tech's another one. Dell is another one. But we, when those companies are doing something, we need to share them on and congratulate them and say, great job. When we see people that don't look like myself and others that are, that are also doing it, like uh, Florida City Sports, do a great job. You know, we look at people like um, uh, uh, Sports Business Journal doing their conferences and creating those pathways again. Great job. We've got to acknowledge those people that are also doing a great job as well. Because when we do that, we, we now we, we now we're we're now breathing life to them. And also, we got to shout out Twitch because Twitch has really stepped up. Garvey and his team, they've stepped up and working with HBCUs on creating these pathways. But we also need to work, lean on Twitch more and say, OK, can you introduce us to some of these brands that are out here that also have money that are given to these predominantly white colleges and they're not giving to any HBCUs, but they're doing it now slowly. But we need more people out there like Garvey and others at Twitch that are also proprietors of this space. And, and they need to also educate and also make um, you know, inroads by introducing uh, the people that we have on this space right now together. Because if we don't do that, those companies don't do that, and those brands don't do that, then we need to take our business someplace else. Okay. So we're this is a this is not a warning. This is not a, a threat. We're saying please give back because we're giving back. The black community spends a lot of money in video games, okay? So if they're paying all this money in video games, playing the games, you can at least give back and show, hey, we like to create some pathways and educate you, right? And so, um, how, how, how'd I sound? Okay, Marcus and I there? <laughs> no, that was perfect, man. Was no, no yeah, man. We, we gotta be honest here. But yeah. we, love, we love what Florida City Sports has done. We yeah. love with uh with uh with you know what, what Full Sail is doing. Full Sail is is uh is just one of the best brands out there, one of the best university brands out there. Period around entertainment, technology, music, everything. They 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 do it all. And so um, I just want to say thank you again to Florida City Sports, uh, Full Sail, to Marcus Howard and Derek for for taking time to 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 have a conversation with us about uh, the pathways into education and the opportunities. But before we go, I want to give Marcus and Derek an opportunity to tell you a little bit more about how they can how you can reach them and the best way to communicate with them. And to and if you really want to sit down and talk to these brothers, talk to them, reach out to them, please, because they're brilliant people. They've already, they've already been vetted. They've already done amazing things out here. They've got integrity and all they need now is an opportunity. Okay, so I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Marcus and then Derek uh, lead the last word with Derek and Marcus on how to get in contact with them and, and any special message to any brand out there that you want to give to them about why it's important to partner with you or Black organizations. Excellent. Yeah, you can connect with me on Facebook or LinkedIn, Marcus Esports Howard. You can also find me on Twitter. There are two of me. Uh, my company's Twitter is Metarena GG. You can also go to the website uh, www.metarena.gg. And, and my message to sponsors is. I wanna help you better connect with your ecosystem. 75% of all US households have at least one gamer in them. So you, I wanna help you understand how to leverage esports to authentically and organically engage your communities the same way or better than the way you are with social media. And it's not a charity move to give back to the black community. It's investing into the ecosystem to Dr. Mark's point that's already putting the dollars in, already putting the attention in, this is the attention uh, attention is the, the highest, most valuable form of currency there is today. You're getting paid ad dollars for the time that you're spending, that, that we're the black community investing into your, your ecosystems. So by giving back to us, we'll be loyal and continue to give back and, and above and beyond into your ecosystems. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to create economic empowerment for, again, brands of all sizes and people from all walks of life. And you can find me on uh, all social media at Hi point gamer all one word no special characters um and you can connect with me on linkedin Derek watford 
uh, or visit my website, www.highpointgamer.com. Um, and I just want to reiterate what Marcus said. Uh, we're here. There's people in the space that are here and willing to put the work in to help you engage authentically, not just uh, give you lip service, but actually authentically and do it in a way that's sustainable. And we're here. Amen. You heard it. Uh, give it up again for Marcus Howard, Derek Wofford. Also going to shout out to other people that are making us sound good on the Wheels of Steel than the one and two. Uh, Anna and James, when people say Wheels of Steel, you know, no, not DJ, but we just trying to have some fun. We got flavor up in this space. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> So we want to make sure that everybody here recognizes the people that made this happen. Again, Matt, thank you so much for believing in us for creating this panel. Um, we're excited and we're looking forward to doing more of these. So Full Sail University, thank you so much. Florida City Sports, shout out to Steve Hogan. Peace, thank you so much, Florida City Sports. And if you want to reach me, you can reach me at and, and all social media at docspitsfire06. That's Doc, D-O-C, Spitzfire 06, Y06, because that's when my greatest fraternity was founded, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And we're out of here. Thank you so much. We will see you soon. Peace. Peace.